So thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. So, John T. Gilbert, uh, echoing the famous first sentence of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, announced in his new history of his native city thus, that there has not been hitherto any work at all deserving the title A History of the City of Dublin has been universally admitted. Gilbert attempted to redress this need in three volumes, the first at the end of 1854 and the other two in 1859. According to Rosa Mulholland, Gilbert's wife, it all began fairly early for her future husband, and I quote, as a small schoolboy, on his way to and from Bective College, he lingered to scan the faces of the houses and to make excursions down streets which were not on his route, pondering the questions of how they came to be there, who built them, by whom they had been inhabited, how many scenes of history they had witnessed, what memorable spirits had once lived this earthly life behind certain walls and windows. I wanted to, he has said, to know something of the past of the city I had been born into. End quote. Fairly sophisticated ruminations for a schoolboy. Uh, now, Gilbert was living at this stage in Jervis Street, where he was born, uh, and he attended, as I said, or as, as his wife said, Bective College. This was a school run by a John Lardner Burke in Rutland, now Parnell Square. And this was only one street, Great Britain Street, now Parnell Street, away from his home. However, in fact, he never wrote in his history about the environments of Jervis Street or Rutland Square, or even about the north side at all. So not only did he visit on his way to school streets not on his route, but whole areas of the city on the other side of the river. It's a wonder he got to school at all, in fact. Um, now, Gilbert the man has been well covered by talks in this series. My presentation this evening will fall into two halves. Firstly, I will look at the work, uh, Gilbert's history, the three volumes, came out in three volumes, and how it was created. Then I will look at the place, what we might call Gilbert's Dublin. Now, Gilbert's history first actually saw the light of day, there's the man himself, uh, in a series of eight anonymous articles under the title The Streets of Dublin in the Irish Quarterly Review, the first appearing in March 1852 and in every subsequent quarterly issue onto the last number of the periodical which came out in December 1853. The Irish Quarterly Review had begun in 1851 and Gilbert had a hand in its inception and according to F.E. Dixon, had contributions of essays and reviews in every number except the first. Although this is hard to quantify as pieces tended to be anonymous. Now elaborating on his view that there was no work available deserving the name of a Dublin history, Gilbert dismissed the only serious attempt at such that of the compilation of Warburton, Whitelaw and Walsh, published in London in 1818 as being, and I quote, long condemned as replete with the grossest inaccuracies and so defective that it does not furnish a reliable account of any portion of the city. Now, strangely, the first instalment of the Streets of Dublin appeared under a notice for the following work. And you see the notice there, a short guide through Dublin, containing practical directions for the easy perambulation. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. A fairly long title. Uh, and, and this was um, under which Gilbert introduced his series on the streets of Dublin. Now, this is strange because um, it would appear to introduce a review of this book, but absolutely no mention is made of it in the subsequent work. He just went on to write his own streets of Dublin. Was there a model for the street-by-street -street work which Gilbert produced? Now, the example he, he alludes to in his preface does not fit the bill. This is Peter Cunningham's Handbook of London, Past and Present, which had been published in 1849, with a second edition in 1850. It is more a gazetteer of contemporary London, with not much history in it. Gilbert also alludes to a work entitled Les Anecdotes de Rue de Paris, 
Now, this title certainly is a very good description of what, of what Gilbert offers readers, but the work itself has proved elusive, and even the powerful tool of the World Wide Web has failed to track it down. So I'm not sure if that was his model either. Um, now, whatever about his purported peregrinations as a schoolboy, certainly from a young age, Gilbert was ransacking the archives for historical material, an aspect of his career well covered by previous speakers in this series uh, again. He was a precocious 24-year-old when the first instalment of The Streets of Dublin appeared. However, his antiquarian researches were not just confined to the dusty archives. He rummaged among the even more dusty The Treatise of the Past. This is evident from a letter to him from P. Robert Webb, then undertaking research in the west of Ireland. He writes, and I quote, I was thinking just before of writing you a few lines, descriptive of my pursuits here, which have been such as you conjecture, and I have several times wished for your company, as I don't forget the effective aid you rendered me in St. Audion's. We have been taking rubbings in the cathedral here, some of which I hope to show you, and among them one of the Galway Monument, older than or as old as that of the Port Leicester. This is the Port Leicester Monument in St. Audion's, uh, and it's obvious from that letter that it had been examined by this man, Robert Webb, under the guidance of Gilbert. So he was actually going out uh, to visit buildings, visit places. He wasn't just confining himself to the, uh, the ivory towers of the archives. Now, the manner in which the work originally appeared in quarterly instalments gave Gilbert the opportunity to follow up suggestions and include extra material put before him by numerous correspondents. As Rosa says, the first papers attracted much attention and letters poured in on the editor of the Irish Quarterly Review from all sides, asking questions concerning historical details of localities, of houses in or about the city, and of the identity and circumstances of certain of their inhabitants. Indeed, as Rosa points out, Gilbert indulged in a certain amount of what we might call today oral history. A quote, the pains taken by the young author to extend his own resources, not only by the discovery of every scrap of written record of the dead, but by drawing from the source of the memories of those still living, are suggested by the great number of letters which remain relating to the work as it progressed through the Irish Quarterly Review. For instance, Dennis Florence McCarthy, poet, young Irelander, Dublin man, in fact he was born in uh, what's now O'Connell Street, uh, and a close friend, uh, asked, um, do you know Alderman Fleming of the old corporation? He lives somewhere in Camden Street at an apothecary's and knows more about the recent history of Daly's than probably any man living. This refers to Daly's Club College Green. Also, a Mr. Miot added, from his personal experiences, some extra information about the interior of Leinster House in the old days. So Gilbert, he wasn't just relying on the archives, relying on monuments and the, the, the treatise of the past, if you like. He was also uh, talking to people and uh, you know, writing down their personal experiences, what we call today uh, oral history. Now, as far as the written records are concerned, Gilbert left no stone unturned from the top down to ferret out material. He wrote to Thomas Larcombe in Dublin Castle in relation to records there, and indeed went further. In June 1854, he, he wrote to the Prime Minister, George Hamilton Gordon, 4th Earl of Aberdeen, seeking permission to consult material in state care in Dublin. And the keeper was instructed to grant him permission to examine and copy material. He wrote seeking material in the Wandesford estate in Castle Comer, and entered into correspondence with the Reverend James Graves, Secretary of the Kilkenny Archaeological Society, seeking records in Kilkenny Castle, relating to the history of a building known as Carberry House, uh, close to the, th the old Tulsal uh, in Skinner's Row in Dublin. This was the great house of the Kildares, and on the retainder, it was granted to Sir Pierce Butler, 9th Earl of Ormond, who renamed it Ormond Hall. Now, nothing appears to have turned up in Kilkenny at the time because he doesn't go into it in any great detail in his published work. But it was there, in fact. 
uh, and almost coincidentally, uh, a deed of 1614 giving a good description of Carberry House and its furnishings was found by the medieval historian Edmund Curtis and passed on to the Old Dublin Society, who meet here, uh, and was published posthumously in the Dublin Historical Record in 1944. So he did miss out on, on, on a few things. Now, a number of interleaved copies of the Streets of Dublin, this was the series of articles in the Quarterly Review, uh, and then the, the consequent history that he wrote based on that material, exist. Now, these, these interleaved copies, they have blank pages between the printed pages in which Gilbert added notes at various times. Uh, a kind of a Victorian word processing, uh, if you like. Um, now, interleaved copies in the National Library uh, show two things. Uh, number one, that additional material was gathered by Gilbert after the streets, that is, the, the, the periodical version came out, um, and some of these were then incorporated into the actual three-volume uh, uh, history of Dublin. A simple example will suffice. In the streets, he records that in 1767, John Latouche contested the parliamentary seat of the city of Dublin with the Marcus of Kildare, and in the interleaved copy, the word unsuccessfully is written in, and this is included then in the history. So there are other examples with much more detailed editions. So the work, the work was kind of accumulating, if you like, as it developed. The second point is that much of the interleaved version has numbered footnotes written in. Now, you might be able to see it there, but there are actually numbers written in by Gilbert, and then he has the references at the bottom of the page. Now, it seems clear that this was intended in the printed history, but for some reason, after much meticulous work on the part of Gilbert, this was not done. In other words, there aren't detailed, numbered footnotes in the published history. And this led to some criticism, as we shall see. So Gilbert's new and improved version came out in three volumes between 1854 and 1859. The first volume was published by McGlashan and the other two by McGlashan and Gill. They were unadorned by illustrations, except by a copy of John Speed's famous map of Dublin of 1610. Now, there was an index, but not a great one. Uh, Gilbert seemed blessed by the women in his life. This is Rosa. Um, uh, and and th some of these women became active collaborators. Uh, the case of Rosa Mulholland is well documented. However, his sister Mary took an, an interest in his Dublin history and transcribed for him. And he, he himself inscribed her name in one of the first volumes to come from the printer under the date December 1854. Mary also worked on an index to the work while on holidays in 1861. Now, if it is the one which was published in 1859, it has all the appearance of one done on rather a short holiday. Uh, in fact, it's quite poor. Um, however, the index to the 1978 Gill and Macmillan edition by Dermot Branagh is a model of its kind and greatly enhances the usefulness of the work. Now, many local historians, they read books from, from the back. They read books backwards. They look at the index first to see if there's a reference to the place they are interested in. Uh, so this Dermot Branagh index is really a wonderful uh, production. Now, um, a blurb in volume three announced that the fourth volume was in the press and would be published shortly. However, it never appeared. The demise of the Irish Quarterly Review in 1853 put a premature end to the, the original work, and Gilbert never managed to have a more complete version published. Now, it seems that sales of the three volumes were slow. Perhaps the half guinea per volume was too much for many. According to F.E. Dixon, the publisher lost interest and passed the remaining unbound sheets to James Duffy, the publisher, who had them bound and printed with a new title in 1861 at the reduced price of seven shillings per volume, one guinea for the lot. Uh, and the new price of three for the price of two seems quite modern. Um, now, a rather strange one-volume edition came out in 1903, and Rosa, in her introduction, states that it was the history shortened and put together for readers who would wish to know something of the original growth of our city, but who are shy of great books. You know, if you haven't time to read long books, this is, this is my... 
Now, Gilbert had been working on this volume at his death. According to Rosa again, it was one of the last pieces of work touched by his hand and is composed of portions selected and condensed from the history of the city of Dublin. Although, again, it was intended that more volumes would follow, it's very strange, strange volume. It only covers the College Green area, and it includes the history of the Parliament, which was already well covered by Gilbert in a book that he wrote himself earlier in 1896 on the, on the Parliament. So it's very, very strange that you brought out this. Or, uh, he worked even on that. Now, the best-known edition of Gilbert's uh, work is the 1978 Gill and Macmillan Sackfield Library reprint, and this is the one we're most familiar with as local historians. Uh, if you like, the boxed set, you might call it. Uh, this, one. this is my well-thumbed, my well-thumbed volumes there. Now, Rose claims that the first volume of 1854 was reviewed in London, Dublin, Edinburgh, and on the continent. Um, a, a review in The Nation sums up the general reaction. I quote, he has taken up our squalidest streets and dingiest alleys, filled them with life and movement, and clothed them with the meaning and beauty of their prime. And he has peopled the fair and prosperous city with her men of rank, her men of substance, and her men of genius. Now, all men <laughs> and men of genius. Uh, some are moved to verse. Um, taking his cue, no doubt, from Keats on first looking into Chapman's Homer, Gilbert's friend, Dennis Florence McCarthy, wrote, I'll, I'll, I'll just re read quickly through it, Long have I loved the beauty of thy streets, fair Dublin, long with unavailing vows, sighed to all guardian deities who rouse the spirits of dead nations to new heats of life and triumph, vain and fond conceits, nestling like eaves warmed doves neath, neath patriot brows, and, and, and it, it, it goes on. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> However, there is a nice bit at the end. I, I like the, 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 the ending of it there, um, where he says, um, uh, there we are. Uh, look, uh, look, look, what life is in these quaint old shops. The, lo the, lo the loneliest lanes are rattling with the roar of coach and chair. Fans, feathers, flambeau, fops flutter and flicker through yon open door where Handel's hand moves, the great organ stops. I mean, that, that's, that's quite a nice uh, uh, part of it. Um, <clears throat> now, th there were quibbles about the work. It was repeatedly pointed out that it was incomplete. The Reverend C.T. McCready, compiler of Dublin's street names, dated and explains, puts it well. This history, very full as far as it goes, is, as is well known, incomplete. It does not touch the north side of our city, nor does it at all ex exhaust the history of the south side. Now, the area covered is quite restricted. Basically, the area within the walls, together with College Green, Grafton Street, and Dawson Street er areas. This is, as far as the history is concerned, Gilbert's Dublin. I sort of just mapped it there. Uh, you can see more or less the inner city area here, and this, this extension uh, covering um, the, the, the south side of that, south of Trinity College, Dawson Street, um, Grafton Street, uh, Kildare Street, uh, and that area. And that's it. It doesn't cover any other part of the city. Um, <clears throat> now, Rosa countered this criticism by blaming Gilbert's fellow countrymen, she says, the fact that most Irishmen prefer horses to books, <laughs> theatres, race courses, and platforms to libraries, denied to the author a practical encouragement which might have resulted in an extension of the history over areas still untouched, and to its enrichment with pictorial illustrations in themselves historical records. And she goes on to say enigmatically, the history of Dublin was never completed a large portion of the city having been left untouched by the author, who had serious reasons besides lack of encouragement from his fellow countrymen for quitting this interesting field for higher and wider ranges of Ireland's history. She acknowledges that, for instance, the castle was not adequately covered. His geographical method of working is he kind of starts with the area around the castle, you know, the sort of medieval idea of the streets huddling around the, the castle, and then kind of works out. But he doesn't cover the castle at all. Uh, um, and she says that some English reviewers noted this, 
But she pointed out that the material he had on this important building was incorporated in his later history of the Viceroy's. So he obviously had material gathered and he used it later in other publications. Dr. I.G. Abeldhauser of Trinity College brought up another point. Some of our college men find fault with the placing of the references at the end of the volume. I do not, for 99 out of 100 like me, will read the book without verification. Uh, as we have seen, Gilbert wrote in numbered footnotes in the interleaved version, but they were never printed. Now, Rosa alludes to this, and she makes the point that the, the, the book would have been too long if footnotes were included. But I think the type of footnote she meant was the old version of footnotes, where you used a footnote to actually expand on material in the text. We've all seen old books where the footnotes are even longer than the text on the page. I think she had that in mind, rather than citations, you know, references and all of that. Now, the following remark found in volume four of the Georgian Society Records, published in 1912, I think is unduly harsh about Gilbert. E. MacDowell Cosgrave and Paige Alp Dickinson, in their article on Taylor's Hall, quote Gilbert in relation to a Jesuit house in Back Lane. And here's the quote. Gilbert's statement, given of course with concealment of his authority, as was his vile fashion, is that it was turned into a military hospital and so used, etc., etc., etc. That's very harsh, I think, on Gilbert. Now, John Pentland Mahaffey, the, the famous provost of Trinity, supervised this volume of the Georgian Society records, and perhaps his hand may be seen here as he elsewhere made critical side swipes at Gilbert. Now, a random check, in fact, if you look at the end of each volume of Gilbert, shows that he was scrupulous in accuracy of citation and fidelity to the, to the original. The problem is that, you know, they're just listed, they're not numbered, it can be difficult to match the reference with the information given. Also, it must be stated that Gilbert's writing style could be long-winded. As uh, Frederick Dixon points out, he was reluctant to edit or condense, believing that anything worth quoting should be quoted verbatim, in extenso. Also, Lady Wilde, uh, Oscar's uh, um, mother, uh, seems to hint at the same thing but is reluctant to offend, she states, claiming that that difficult chapter on the Parliament House is admirably done. She does, she does admit it is difficult, and it is difficult. It's a difficult chapter. Now, the publisher, McClashan, reported that the antiquarian Lord Talbot de Malahide believed that it would add to the book if representations of the pictures of old Dublin buildings now removed or any odds and ends of old Dublin had been included. Rosa stated that Gilbert did in fact collect prints and engravings uh, of parts of the city no longer to be seen. And his lists, his, Gilbert's own lists in the book, of paintings and prints, especially in the appendices, show his interest in art. So it's kind of strange that illustrations were not included. Now, however, some prints from his collection were later used in a number of other works, such as the Calendar of Ancient Records of Dublin. Now, we must keep in mind that Gilbert was working very much in the antiquarian tradition. He links the street or building with its archival accretion, and long hours were spent culling reference after reference and piling them on the page. Very little attempt is made at analysis or interpretation. There can be so much a wealth of detail that the wood is not seen for the trees, or perhaps to use an urban version of the same, the city is lost for the towers and steeples. There's no sense of the city in toto. But of course, Gilbert was writing when modern scientific history was only in its infancy. Now, it's fascinating to think that, as Brendan Toomey pointed out in his Gilbert lecture here two years ago, that Gilbert may have met the great exponent of this new history, Leopold von Ranke, when he visited uh, Ireland. However, what Gilbert achieved was a huge step forward in its own right. The scrupulous presentation of the primary sources had been lacking in histories of the city until then. However, such industry was not, wasn't quite unique. I mean, there were attempts before. For instance, John Dalton's work on the county of Dublin, Dublin County in 1830, uh, is a similarly very impressive work. Gilbert was anxious that his work be brought to the attention of the great and the good. He sent a copy to John Henry Newman, 
uh, who wrote thanking him, uh, and is said to have made good use of it when he later resided in Dublin. Gilbert had been proposed and rejected for election to the Royal Irish Academy in 1852, but his ongoing work on the history of Dublin clinched it, and in 1855 he was elected, and in 1862 awarded the prestigious Cunningham Medal for the history. At the award of the medal, William Reeves said, he has produced a work which has been and will continue to be read with interest and referred to as an authority, not only by partial friends and fellow acad academicians, but by all who may in our own time and future generations study the history and antiquities of the city of Dublin. Now, the truth of this is borne out, uh, and Gilbert's his history has been constantly cited in hundreds of essays, articles, and books on the city. The articles in the Dublin Historical Record, appearing between 1938 and 2009, in those, Gilbert is cited no less than 212 times. I didn't count them, but I used the web just to do it. <laughs> uh, now, the awarding ceremony for the Gilbert Medal for his history of Dublin had more than, than a touch of the Pickwick Club about it. Immediately afterwards, uh, the Reverend Samuel Houghton read a paper on experiments to determine the velocities of rifle bullets commonly used, <laughs> giving the impression of a trigger-happy, if scholarly lot. <laughs> uh, so it must have been some evening. Now, interleaving, as I've pointed out, was a compulsive activity of Gilbert. Now, I would like to interleave the topics and themes of Gilbert with some of my own particular reflections on inner-city Dublin, Gilbert's Dublin, if you like especially discovered made since Gilbert's time, and how the past lives in the present. I will occasionally dart down alleys of my own, riding a few personal hobby horses. Now, much has been unearthed about the story of the confined area covered by Gilbert in his history since he laid down his pen. He largely ignored the Vikings and their enormous impact. And of course, he was writing long before the famous mid-20th century Dublin excavations, of course. But another scholar was researching the Viking impact more or less at the same time Gilbert was undergoing his researches. Uh, this was Charles Halliday, who, in the very year in which Gilbert's first Dublin volume appeared, 1854, had a paper on the ancient name of Dublin published in the Proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy based on a paper which he had read to the Society some time before. Halliday continued his researches on Viking Dublin in Irish and Scandinavian sources, and this was posthumously published as The Scandinavian Kingdom of Dublin in 1882, edited by Halliday's and Gilbert's mutual acquaintance, John P. Prendergast. Charles Halliday and John Gilbert had much in common. Both had business backgrounds, wine importing in the case of Gilbert and banking in the case of Halliday. Both inhabited villas on Dublin's south coast, Villanova, Blackrock in Gilbert's case and Halliday's Monkstown Park. Both were scholars and avid collectors of Irish books and pamphlets. Gilbert's forming the nucleus of the collection housed in this building and Halliday's forming important collections in the Royal Irish Academy, the National Library and Farm Lee. Now, a possible explanation for Gilbert's neglect of the Viking past in his history may have been deference to the ongoing work of his senior colleague. Hall uh, Halliday delved almost as deeply into the archives as Gilbert did, but much of the story of Viking Dublin would be found not in the archives, but below ground. Scientific archaeology was only beginning in Halliday's and Gilbert's day. The story of Gilbert's Dublin, you know, that inner city area, has been transformed by the work of archaeologists in the intervening period, beginning with the excavations undertaken in the Christchurch Place Woodkey area. Now, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that I'm not going to revisit the Woodkey Civic Buildings saga. However, a glimpse of what might have been is experienced when I walk students through the trace of the Viking house on Wine Tavern Street. In fact, I was just there this afternoon with a group of American University students. Or when I show them perhaps the exquisite Viking ship found on the Civic Building's site, 
Seamus Heaney's lines, I think, captured this whole area well and its Viking past. Although Seamus was writing of a related artefact, in fact, an incised ship, but I think his lines just, I think, captured extremely well. Magnified on display so that the nostril is a migrant prow sniffing the Liffey, swanning it up the ford, dissembling itself in antler combs, bone pins, coins, weights, scale pans. Like a long sword sheeted in its moisting burial clays, the keel stuck fast in the slip of the bank, its clinker-built hull pined and plosive as Dublin. Now, Viking Dublin has been well raked over by others now, but from the medieval period, Gilbert's Dublin was replete with ecclesi ecclesiastical sites, and he discusses in his work most of them. So, uh, from uh, Howard Clark, Sarah Dents, and Ruth Johnson's book, uh, Dublinia, The Story of Medieval Dublin, it's a good overview of the many ecclesiastical sites that were in existence from uh, medieval times in Dublin. Now, in relation to these, it's a story of contradictions, of destruction, rediscovery, belated conservation, and reuse. This one here, just outside the area of what I have called Gilbert's Dublin, has great personal resonance for me. It is St. Nicholas without and St. Luke's off the comb. I visited this site on one of my very first local history outings. I was barely out of my teens, in the last century, so last millennium, in fact. <laughs> uh, uh, now, to enter its gateway was to enter a different world. A long country lane, just, just off the comb now, a long country lane leading to a simple yet dignified church. Somebody asked, uh, St. Nicholas without what? Uh, a congregation uh, was the answer. <laughs> but of course, it's St. Nicholas without the walls, as you probably know, and as opposed to St. Nicholas within, within the walls. Um, it made a deep impression on me, and I meant to go back, but I left it too late. This is it. It was dismembered to make way for the new Coombe Bypass. But... It's a pity it couldn't have been done some other way. I'm not going to go into all of these conservation issues, but it is a pity that it couldn't have been done some other way, you know? Um, I mean, a site like this, to me, is a portal to the past, a time capsule, if you like, a touchstone to stimulate our historical imagination. Having taught local history for many years now, I've come across many students for which, either as adults or as children, a site like this has been the catalyst for a journey of historical discovery which has led to works of research of considerable accomplishment and also a deep sense of personal fulfilment. You know, that's the true purpose, I suppose, of education. Although the ensemble of entrance, Am's House, which you see in the roof almost gone there, laneway, churchyard and place of worship is dismembered and like Humpty Dumpty cannot be put together again. The church survives in a sorry state. Um, some of you might know it awaiting an uncertain future. A belated conservation plan was commissioned by the City Council and published in 2005. But there it is now, St. Nicholas, without a purpose, without dignity, without a friend. However, the, the destruction of churches is nothing new. And a number have disappeared without trace above ground, perhaps awaiting the archaeologist's trowel. Gilbert himself quotes Richard Stanyhurst, he was mentioned earlier this evening, writing of St. George's, this was just off George's Street, in, in 1586. So this is a report of Stanley Hurst's from 1586. He believed that the Church of St. George had been built by some Garth or Knight of St. George. And here's what Stanley Hurst says. This chapel hath been of late raised, and the stones thereof, by consent of the assembly, turned to a common oven, converting the ancient monument of a doughty, adventurous and holy knight to the colliery sweepings of a puff loaf baker. <laughs> uh, other churches mentioned by Gilbert, but now lost, at least above ground, include St. Martin's, uh, St. Mary del Dam, St. Olaf's, also known as St. Tullock's, all gone when Gilbert was writing about them. However, St. John's, at the top of Fishamble Street, was still standing. It was demolished in 1884. However, gravestones from its former graveyard 
lie on the doorstep of the civic buildings. So it, it has a certain presence today. Now, when the little graveyard of Kevin Street, known as the Cabbage Garden, was dedicated in 1685, the following prayer was intoned. Accept, we beseech thee, the small offering which we this day presumed to dedicate to the honour of thy holy name. Preserve it from all human violations and barbarism, that the bones of thy servants which be gathered here may lie quiet and undisturbed. And this is it today. Well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of still there, small little park. Uh, I don't know why you'd regard that as the bones being undisturbed, but uh, anyway. Most of the burials uh, in the Cabbage Garden were of Huguenots. The fate of their co-religionists in nearby French Peters uh, was, was more disturbing. The small graveyard was taken over by the growing Jacob's Biscuit Factory, and their remains were removed to Mount Jerome in 1968, and the little recreation garden that Jacob's had made was built over. And this is some of the Jacob's workers enjoying their break in that little graveyard. However, it was completely built over. It required, in fact, an act of the Oroxus to do this. And in my research on the history of Jacob's, an ex-employee told me that the street traders in Camden Street had their own take on this. Uh, one of them says, oh, yeah, the old Protestants, yeah, they were taken up to Mount Jerome in biscuit tins. <laughs> uh, so, um, by the way, the nearby Church of St. Peter's, so for Church of Ireland St. Peter's, it was the French, Pe French Peter's, the Huguenot St. Peter's, the Church of Ireland Peter's, uh, suffered the same fate, completely gone. Um, despite it being the possible burial place of Robert Emmett, um, however, I won't open that can of worms. Sorry, excuse the poem. Uh, um, uh, anyway, look, I, I'm going off on a hobby horse, a bit far from Gilbert's Dublin. Uh, look, anyway, at least many of the tombstones within Gilbert's Dublin area have been recorded. For instance, those of St. John's in volume 7 of the Journal of the Society for the Preservation of the Memorials of the Dead, and those of St. Anne's uh, in Dawson Street, which Gilbert also mentions. They are in volume 4 of that same journal. And that burial ground is gone as well. Now, in the case of St. John's, the vestry book has survived and has been edited. Uh, so not only the parish is dead, but its living, worshipping community can be recreated, at least in our historical imagination. So all is not lost, if you like. Vestiges of other religious sites hang on in remnants and fragments. The ancient effigies found in St. Werberus, for instance. And, of course, medieval St. Audience itself, with its memorials and tombs, and, of course, still in use, public worship. Other sacred sites are still in use, but for less than sacred purposes. It can be a little unsettling, downing a pint of Guinness, as I did recently, in front of this inscription in Old St Mary's, now the pub known as the church, a stone's throw from Gilbert's birthplace. Very strange, drinking a pint of Guinness and reading this, staring at you. The members of the Association for the Discountenancing Vice and Promoting the Knowledge and Practice of the Christian have raised this last tribute to William Watson. So poor William Watson, whoever he was. Um, as the Dublin man would say, if he was alive today, he'd be torn in his grave. So, uh, now, in some cases, the churchyards have disappeared and maybe the churches remain and vice versa. Most interesting of all has been the almost miraculous rediscovery of the past, religious and secular, by superb archaeology over the past half century or so. That of Isolde's Tower is well known. The Augustinian uh, Friars House in Cecilia Street was rediscovered by Lindsay Simpson. The archaeology, you can see the, uh, some of the walls there, and part of the arches at the bases of the walls were uncovered. It might surprise you, that you can also raise a glass contemplating this as well. There it is today. Uh, it's part of Luigi Malone's restaurant. Uh, and it has been reconstructed more or less in situ. And in all fairness to them, they have a wonderful display in the basement there. You can go in there and have a meal or whatever you like. And they have a wonderful display of the, you know, uh, matters relating to the archaeology of the area. So all is not lost. Sometimes, despite our best efforts, the past intrudes. And it can be dramatic. St. Martin's Church, just off Werber Street, 
and according to Gilbert, it disappeared in the early part of the 16th century. But in 1785, part of the pavement in Derby Square, now gone, gave way to reveal a cavern 40 feet deep, revealing a great quantity of coffins and bones. Probably the debris of the old cemetery of St. Martin's Church, as Gilbert puts it. Now, Derby Square was eulogised by a latter-day Dublin troubadour in ambivalent verses about the city of his childhood. And I quote, How can I leave the town that brings me down, that has no jobs, is blessed by God, and makes me cry, Dublin? And at sea, with flowing hair, I'd think of Dublin, of Grafton Street and Derby Square, and those for whom I really care, and you. Who is it, I wonder? You might be surprised. It's um, a song called In Dublin by Thin Lizzy's Phil in it. By the way, when his statue was removed just a short uh, while ago for repairs, I noticed a handwritten note attached to the plinth to the effect that Phil was away for a while being looked after by his mum. I was delighted to see that some true blue dub had indignantly crossed out the word mum and inserted ma. <laughs> Uh, now, both Phil and Derby Square are now gone. But, in fact, this leads us on to another aspect of Dublin, which was highlighted really for the first time by Gilbert. The numerous courts and small squares entered by alleys leading from main streets. Historians of London have called such places a city within a city. They arose from attempts by property owners to maximise rents by building on narrow back gardens and yards. However, they weren't always the overcrowded, slum-like rookeries of the Victorian period. Eminent printers had their shops in them, and the great dean himself, Jonathan Swift, was born in Hoey's Court, which was entered through Cole's Alley, and it's now the, um, the castle steps. Their names read like a litany, through the work. Saul's court, Kennedy's court, Bertram's court. Uh, Crampton court, although much altered, probably retains a little of the atmosphere of these old nooks. By the way, they were not just confined to the city centre. I remember two from growing up in Rathmines. Indeed, I sometimes stayed in one of them with relations of mine. The other, entered to an archway behind what was called Belfield House in Upper Rath Mines, was complete with hens and chickens, even at the time. Just returning to our churches just for a moment, um, probably the saddest story is that of St Michael's and John's, Exchange Street Lower. It was dedicated in 1815, and the installation by the parish priest, the Catholic Church, the Reverend Dr Blake, of a bell, the first since the Reformation, it was claimed, to call Catholics to worship and say the Angelus signified a new era as the penal system was being dismantled. This angered some, and Alderman Carlton of the corporation started legal proceedings, but backed off when he heard that Daniel O'Connell had joined the fray. Now, this bell became the logo used in the 1929 centenary of emancipation, and a copy of it was erected on Rory O'Moore Bridge, where it still remains. By the way, a badge was also brought out for the um, anniversary, and I picked up a, a, one of them uh, some time ago, and I couldn't resist wearing it for the occasion. I was always a little bit of an anorak anyway. <laughs> uh, so, um, the original bell, by the way, uh, although recast in 1940, is still in place, in the small bell coat above the building. Now, the recent faith of this historic church has been lamentable, as Christine Casey rightly points out. It was, as she says, brutally remodelled in 1996 in the name of Heritage as a Viking centre. However, what's done is done, but amid the loss, something was found and restored. St Michael's and John's was, of course, Smock Alley Theatre. And during the archaeological work carried out by again Lindsay Simpson, at the time the building was being transformed, it was found that much of the fabric of the theatre survived and now stands revealed, if you like. 
it's good to see the smock alley now lives as a theatre again. And I love this depiction of it re used recently. Uh, of course, a major theme of Gil Gilbert's is the theatre. Indeed, volume two could be called the theatre volume, as 45% of the commentary is just on two theatres, Smock Alley and Crow Street. Now, the great rags to riches celeb of the 18th century British and Irish theatre was, of course, that child of the Dublin streets, the actress Margaret Peg Waffington. Second to her was Kitty Clive, who lived in Dane Street. There are many paintings and prints of the Divine Peg. She's all over the place in prints and drawings. Um, and in fact, Gilbert had one of her pasted into one of his interleaved volumes, together with other glamorous actresses. Anyway, um, now, there's no pin-up of Kitty Clive in it, but an exquisite image of her in the flesh, or at least in porcelain, can be seen hidden away in a corner of the Curator's Choice Cabinet in the National Museum, Collins Barracks. It was made at the Bow Street factory in London. Now, this little object brings Smock Alley to life for me. It's rivaled only by the series of prompt books from the same theatre, Smock Alley, and they survive now in the University of Virginia. These are actual prompt books, you know, with, with directions for the actors written in from Smock, Smock Alley. At least seven for, survive for Smock Alley, a rare survivor from this very, very early period. Um, they they uh, include Macbeth, uh, Hamlet, Othello, and o other plays. Just on that bow factory for a moment, um, the bow factory in London pioneered the production of hard paste porcelain in Britain and Ireland. Indeed, its invention is attributed to Thomas Fry of Edenderry, County Offaly, the co-founder of the factory. Now, Fry was a prominent member of the school of mezzo-tint engravers working in Dublin in the 1740s and noted by Gilbert in his discussion of the Dublin Society Academy. There is Peg Waffington by James McArdle, who was one of this school of Dublin mezzotint engravers. And really, the slide doesn't do justice to the really superb quality of those mezzotint works. And again, Dublin was foremost in leading these islands in, in the production of these. It's a great loss for Dublin that Fry didn't establish his porcelain works here in Dublin. It would have been another first for Dublin. But his ingenuity and talent and the talent of, of his fellow artists drew them to the greater London market. Now, part of Crow Street has also been rediscovered, uh, once again by Lindsay Simpson. Um, and this was the great rival to Smock Alley. And it was founded by Spranger Barry and Henry Woodward in 1757. And this is uh, Henry Woodward. Peg Waffington's mother sold fruit on the street nearby at the entrance to Fine's Court. Perhaps she's the very one delineated by Hamilton's Cries of Dublin. Now, Gilbert celebrates the painting, No Loss, the actual painting of uh, Peg Waffington by James Latham, the well-known artist, sometimes known as the Irish Van Dyke. And thereby hangs another anecdote. Latham lived in Trinity Lane, and he was asked at one stage to paint the portrait of a lady of distinction with coarse lineaments. Now, he did so, but she was disgusted with it and verbally attacked the artist. He tore it from its frame, nailed it to the floor of the hall of his house as oilcloth so that everyone walking in would step over it. The lady tried in vain to buy it, but Latham peremptorily refused and was so ungallant as to have her effigy trodden under the feet even of his domestics. <laughs> uh, now, before we leave the theatre world, um, a dose of revisionism. I'm going to be shocked here now. Really. Gilbert doubted that Handel's Messiah was first performed in Dublin. <laughs> So we had, we had reference to Handel in the wonderful poem, Handel, the organ stops. They may not have worked to the notes of the Hallelujah chorus at all. He states, here's his quote, Although an attempt has been recently made to argue that the Messiah was first performed in Dublin, no adequate evidence has yet been adduced to disprove the contrary assertion of Mannering, the contemporary biographer of the composer, and the statements of Mr Gardner, author of the work entitled Music and Friends, 
So whatever their references are, and the references are this. Mannerings and Gardner's contention is that the work was first performed in London with little attention paid to it, and then in Dublin. Now, there's the music hall that you, I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, scene, and there is Our Lady's Choral Society singing it every April. What are they going to do? <laughs> uh, now, in fact, I'll be delighted because um, they think they own the Bloomin' work, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm a member of the Tala Choral Society. <laughs> You'd want to hear our hallelujah chorus. No, no, no. That's off the record, but, and I'm only joking. Right? Uh, however, to redress the balance a little bit, in the intervening years after Gilbert wrote uh, that, um, the pendulum has swung in favour of Dublin again, you'll be glad to know. Uh, and unfortunately, I've no more explosive news uh, evidence to present. Now, the bustling commercial life of Gilbert's Dublin is conjured up in the myriad of shops of printers, apothecaries, silk and wool merchants, and purveyors of coffee and gossip, and is well captured in McCarthy's line that we quoted, look, look, what life is in these quaint old shops. One rare survival is, of course, Reed's Cutlery Shop, found in Parliament Street since that thoroughfare was created in 1753. And, of course, there were elsewhere before that. It's, it's a sad sight. It's falling apart before our eyes. It pains me to pass every time uh, I go there. Can something not be done before that's lost, uh, 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 lost also? I mean, thousands of tourists must pass it every week. Surely it can find a role in the ever-growing uh, tourist industry while retaining its integrity. Now, it flickers to life for me in an original letter. There's the interior of it, the Peter Pearson picture of it. It flickers to life for me in an original letter in my own modest collection to the shop by the Earl of Gosford, written from County Armagh, written in 1790. And here he, he, he writes, uh, Dundalk, November the 29th, 1790. Sir, you know, it's written to, you can see the, the cover, um, Mr. Reid, Parliament Street, Dublin, and written from Dundalk, um, and the, twen the date is, <coughs> sorry, the date is on it. Sir, I want, you won't be able to read it, but I, I have it transcribed here. I want a large carving knife and fork for the servant's table. You know, I suppose, what is proper. I shall be obliged to you to have it packed up and shall write to the maid in my house to call on you for it. So you will be required to give directions to deliver it to her. It will be sent down by the stage, so must be packed accordingly. I have been in town for a day or two and I'm so far on my road home, he's writing from Dundalk, uh, I was so hurried when there, that was in Dublin, that I totally forgot to call at your house. My deceased friend was in your debt for two razors, which I shall pay for when I next go to town. I desire my compliments to Mrs. Reed. So, it very much comes to life, I think, in a little letter like that. Now, probably the most colourful anecdote that Gilbert relates is associated with the nearby Anglesey Street. It concerns the putative heir to the huge Anglesey titles and fortune. James or Jemmy Annesley, this was the heir to, to, the, to the Anglesey fortune, uh, he was reduced to the status of urchin on the streets of Dublin by a greedy uncle claiming his birthright. And perhaps he knew that other urchin running around the streets at the same time, Peg Waffington, the more as contemporaneous. Um, in 1728, Richard Annesley, the, James's uncle, had him, aged 12, snatched and sold into slavery in America. He eventually escaped and instituted legal proceedings against his uncle. The case was an 18th century sensation and inspired five novels, including Walter Scott's Guy Mannering and Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped. There's Annesley, Kidnapped. Now, Gilbert's long-winded telling of the tale proves he would never have made a novelist. <laughs> However, the story has been taken up by other chroniclers of Dublin since and has leapt to life again from the pages of, uh, of Gilbert in a recent book, Birthright, the true story that inspired Kidnapped by an American writer, uh, Robert A. Kirsch, and a BBC documentary by the architectural historian and broadcaster Dan Cruikshank, some of you might have seen it, called Kidnapped, a Georgian adventure in which Dublin features prominently. Now, speaking of uh, gems or jemmies or shems or shems, James Joyce. 
while in Trieste, sighed for a copy of Gilbert's Dublin. He writes to his brother Stanislaus, I thought of beginning my story, Ulysses, but have too many cares at present. He then goes on to say, You remember the book I spoke to you of one day in the park, into which I was going to put William Dara and Lady Belvedere. Even then, I was on the track of writing a chapter of Irish history. I wish I had a map of Dublin and views and Gilbert's history. Joyce was tying with the idea of writing about the area of Belvedere College, where he had been at school. William Dara owned a house nearby. Again, Gilbert would not have been much use to him as he didn't treat of the north side at all, as we, as we know, in, in his in, in particular work, the, 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 the history. Now, Gilbert also features in Finnegan's Wake. In a parody of antiquarian writing, Joyce cites the Dublin historians James Ware, John Dalton, Charles Halliday, the scholar Luke Wadding, and the Norman chronicler Geraldus Cambrensis, or as in typical Joycean fashion he calls them, Gerontes Cambronses. Um, and Gilbert, Gilbert is also mentioned. Now here's an extract. I'm not going to read this extract because I don't understand it, and uh, it's complex, but I just want to point out the reference to Gilbert, okay? It's, it's, it's a parody of, of antiquarian writing. He said, Gilia, a cooler blend, Dalton insists, ex equo with Papia, Arancita, Clara, Maranuza, Indra, etc. In Halliday's view, and then he goes on down to the very end, he speaks of a tribe called the Sullivani. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. And then he said, as Gilbert at first suggested, I'm not going to read all that because I don't understand it, but it's obviously a parody, a parody of, of uh, antiquarian writing. Um, <clears throat> There's another Joyce in connection of an incidental or perhaps even coincidental nature that Joyce would really have liked. He liked coincidences. Um, in one of the interleaved copies, Gilbert inserted a raffle ticket sold at the Araby Fete, held at Ballsbridge in 1894. The subject and indeed the title of Joyce's well-known story in Dubliners. Gilbert probably saved it because the raffle was for Jervis Street Hospital on the street where he was born. By the way, I noticed that the first prize was a magnificent, genuine Chippendale mirror presented by the Lord Mayor and his fellow corporation members. I hope it didn't come off a wall in the mansion house. That's <laughs> <new one>. uh, <laughs> um, now, the only area covered by Gilbert outside the walled city is that of the College Green and Grafton Street uh, district to the south and, and slightly um, east. Land, what are called in the early records, the lands of, of Tib and Tom. The old Parliament House in College Green features prominently. Indeed, Volume 3 could be called the Parliament House Volume because over a third of the text is given to it. Another building which features prominently in Volume 3 is Northland House in Dawson Street, home of the Royal Irish Academy. No coincidence, I would think, in a work by a young man hoping for recognition by that very same institution. Gilbert was somewhat obsessed by the Parliament building. He later brought out a whole book, as I've said before, to it, and it takes prominent place in the 1903 single-volume edition. Now, it, it is also by the subject of an early error by the great man. In the streets, the periodical version and the history itself, he states that the building on the site known as Chichester House, which was used for meetings of the Parliament, was built by Sir George Carew, President of Munster and Lord High Treasurer of Ireland. This is a mistake. The man in question was a near contemporary, uh, Sir George Carey, Treasurer of the Army. Now, he corrects this in his 1896 book on the Parliament, but the error had already been in print twice. So even Homer nods. Now, the great and the good who received compensation at the time of the Union are often enumerated. But I particularly like the appendix by Gilbert of the office holders of the Houses of Parliament compensated in the form of annuities. These are people associated with the actual Houses of Parliament themselves. It's headed by John, Earl of Clare, Black Jack Fitzgibbon, Lord Chancellor and Speaker, who received £3,978, three shillings and fourpence. That's an annuity now. And it goes down to Mary Connor, housekeeper in the Commons, who received £4.11 shillings and includes Thomas Seavers and Rodney Waitham, 
firelighters who received £11, 7 shillings and sixpence and £6, 16 shillings and sixpence respectively. However, the fires still blaze in the old house, thanks to the Bank of Ireland. One just outside the House of Lords is a popular stopping off point for warming their hands for my American students on their walking tours of Dublin every January. However, I do worry about th that those well-kindled fires sometimes. Um, <laughs> this is a print from Gilbert's uh, uh, history of the Parliament. By the way, those depictions I had were of Chichester House, the original building, and the interior of Chichester House with the Parliament House of Lords in session. Now, the future of that great building, the Parliament House, has been the subject of some controversy lately, but I'm delighted to see that its environments have been more and more used for great public gatherings and indeed great oratory uh, once again. Now, early printing was a speciality of John Gilbert, there being in his library many important examples in fine preservation. Many of these are specimens of Dublin printing and publishing. So wrote Douglas Hyde and DJ O'Donoghue in the introduction to the catalogue to his works. And so let us finish where we began. From Swerve of Shore to Bend of Bay brings us by a commodious vicus of recirculation, as Joyce might have said, back to the world of books. Gilbert's interest in books can be seen in the fact that within the small area he covers, he names 127 printers and publishers. Now, partly due, no doubt, to the thriving pirating of works in Dublin due to a lack of a copyright law here and, of course, cheaper overheads for printers and publishers. Now, there's only left, uh, time left to refer to some of the most celebrated of the Dublin printers and publishers. And Gilbert's not without humour here. One of the most famous, George Faulkner, the printer, had, he informs us, a leg amputated. And it was buried, the leg, as was the custom. He had one foot in the grave, according to the <laughs> Dublin wits. Now, although Gilbert doesn't cite this, nor does a copy appear in this catalogue of books, both Faulkner and Grierson, the foremost Dublin printers of the day, had their own sense of humour and displayed their wit in a joint address they published, lamenting the state of the book trade in Dublin in 1745. Now, quote, The humble petition of George Faulkner and George Grierson, printer and bookseller, Dublin, 1745. Your petitioners can assert that they have not for a considerable time past sold any books, though they have, at a great expense, provided themselves with the worst, uh, excepting some few old sermons against popery, and the newest country dances. That's all the books that were selling. <laughs> your petitioners as sensible of your, uh, as your honours can be of the little use and importance of that learning and knowledge that is contained in books and would not be misunderstood to recommend to your honours the useless drudgery of reading, which would be too much break upon your precious time. Your petitioners taken them to prove that a certain number of books well chosen, are cheaper than furniture and wear longer than a good Genoa damask. <laughs> 1,000 books, if collected by the joiner, will, together with the proper wainscot ornaments, shelves and partitions, completely furnish one large room. <laughs> Which books, one with another, need not exceed two shillings apiece, amounting in all to £100, whereas 200 of Genoa damask, which we take to be at least 14 shillings per yard, Books are much cheaper to use as furniture, they're saying, in, in effect. Other suggestions for books included lapping them around candles, lighting the tea lamp with them, using them to pin up Mrs. Hare, uh, or to make kites for young masters, or to wet and put upon his forehead when he falls down and cries. And they say, in short, for a thousand other purposes for which paper has of late been found much more useful and the old ones of reading and writing. <laughs> and all this before the era of iPads and tablets. <laughs> Thankfully, the book trade sort of revived, and John Gilbert collected them. And so we have the wonderful library here upstairs. Their richness inspired Gilbert to set down on paper the annals of his native city. If, as Alexis de Tocqueville claimed, 
And I quote, History is a gallery of pictures in which there are few originals and many copies. Then John Gilbert was certainly one of the originals, perhaps even, as far as our city is concerned, the original. 